Well, good morning. This is for September 6th, 2020, and we are looking at Jude 17 and 18. I've already preached in one message. This is the second part of it, and the message is about the last days there will be mockers. And as we look at Jude chapter 1, there is only one chapter, verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't apostles uh, later, it's the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ that he chose. And, uh, of course, we didn't hear the words so we're restricted to finding them written down. And there were three writing prophets that gave us things to heed. Uh, Paul and Peter and Apostle John. And those three apostles wrote down things to heed because there were people who were coming to the church and they were teaching false doctrine, even in the very first century. And... Uh, I'm glad in a way, that sounds strange, but I'm glad in a way that they had their troubles in the first century because when they wrote about them, then their words were there for us as instruction some 20 centuries later, 2020, and uh, so that's been helpful. So we looked at the words from Paul, we looked at the words from Peter, and then we looked at the words from John, and they were instructive to us. And then we went on, and we looked at the rest of that verse, uh, verse 18, that they were saying to you, in the last times there will be mockers. Mockers make fun of things. And uh, we preached two areas last week. They mock the word of God. They say, oh, it's full of air. Oh, it can't be relied upon. Oh, that's an ancient book. It's got nothing to say for the 20th century. And we preached about that and what the Bible has to say about itself. And it's the only book that God has ever written. And 40 different authors, at least, uh, who uh, wrote over the space of 1,500 years, with a consistent beginning and end, and prophecy and uh, consistency all throughout. Of course, there are universities who try to poke holes in the Bible and uh, suck the life out of the faith of uh, young Christian people going to the universities. And so we as pastors have to be ready to uh, shore them back up if they happen to go to those institutions. And for heaven's sakes, don't take a Bible course from a secular university, and even Christian colleges, you have to be very careful anymore these days. And uh, so, uh, the inerrancy of the scriptures, and they mock that, and then they mock the Savior, and that he wasn't virgin born, that he was just a man and not the God man, that he didn't really die for our sins, or that he died on the cross, yes, but he didn't raise from the dead, or he's not coming again. And that was what the criticism was uh, that we found in Peter. Oh, he's not coming back. All things are the same, even from creation. And when they say this, it says in Peter, it escapes them that uh, there was a worldwide flood in there. And uh, the Lord is going to destroy the world again, but not by water. Next time it's going to be by fire. So uh, we looked at the Savior, the creation, and now we are, um, we are looking at the creation. And I remember as I was growing up in high school, and I didn't know that people questioned that the world was not created in seven literal days until my brother was starting to tell me some of these things. I thought it was some type of hot shot coming up with the day-age theory, uh, where the days were not literal, but they were more allegorical or figurative, and uh, or uh, the, uh, the gap theory, 
where between verse in verse one the world was created and uh, formless and void and God spoke and caused things to happen and they put a gap in there of millions and billions of years if you need them so that it doesn't contradict science uh, that's questionable science anyway to say that all oh, this rock is a billion years old based upon isotopes and decay and things like this when there's so many things that can affect that and uh, so they can get that wrong and the day age theory isn't really correct you know God said uh, God created the world in six literal days on the seventh day he rested and I want you Jews to uh, observe the same thing that you work for six days and on the seventh day you rest too. So that to be one to one correspondence, it has to be the same time period. And we certainly can't wait for a million years for the first day to go by and the second million years to go by and before the second day passes. Uh, that just makes the whole thing nonsensical. And uh, people say, well, come on, you know, we can't have God creating the world in six literal days. Uh, I mean, that's just so complex and everything. Man, you need to get yourself a bigger God. You need to let God be God. He is stupendous and absolutely beyond comprehension. He's greater than the supercomputers. He's greater. He can crunch numbers. There isn't a computer that can keep up with him. I mean, he is so fantastic and so great. And all this engineering and things that we're doing today, we're just starting to figure out things that he's already known. And so he's a great God and he has created science and he's created the laws and he's the one that holds the world together. Uh, so the day age theory is bogus. Uh, the gap theory is bogus. Uh, when I was going to college in 1969, there was a movie that came on. I think it was 2001, and uh, it had great music to it. And the idea was that they had these these ape-like looking men, and they were just acting like animals. And then this obelisk showed up. And when they were exposed to this obelisk, all of a sudden they began to make tools and started to have warfare and things like this. And that was kind of the way they gave the nod to something called theistic evolution, where uh, there was creation but uh, and there were animals and things. But when man became a being where he was aware of himself, God did that. And that was kind of a theory that they had back at that time. Well, 2001 has come since then. And uh, we, have, we have seen these things for what they are. They're just man's uh, machinations trying to, in some way or another, understand or make up a different way that creation was. And uh, the supposed ages of the rocks... And they, they say that they're millions and millions of years of old. And you don't really know that because no man's lived that, back, that long. Uh, they can take a live clam and they can date that thing and they can be 3,000 years old. And it's, it's fluey. They can go to a lava bed and they can test it here. And in the lava bed, it says it's uh, 10,000 years old. And uh, they find out that that lava came out of the earth and it just happened. It can't be 10,000 years old. So there's all kinds of things that show that these systems are wrong. The isotopes that they say decay at a, a rate, well, there are things that can make that decay at a faster rate. And uh, we aren't around to notice that. Uh, when I was in high school, I had occasion in, in the uh, cafeteria to... Uh, pop a lunch bag and one of the men who was the monitor in the uh, lunch room he came up and he said um, young man I want you to tell me about uh, you like big bangs 
I want you to tell me about the Big Bang uh, tomorrow. So I went and I found out, looked it up in an encyclopedia, and there was this Big Bang that supposedly happened when the world was created. And uh, all of the mass that you see today and all the planets and all the stars at one time were supposedly compressed into a, a pellet about the size of a dot. I mean, if you can believe that, you can believe about anything. And then they, it was so super compressed that it, it exploded upon itself and it flung out all of the mass and started making all these materials and these planets and stuff. Hey, if you can believe that it came from that little dot, why don't you go a step further and say God created the heavens and the earth from nothing? But at any rate, I told him what the Big Bang Theory was. And uh, so, you know, it's been popularized by a show called The Big Bang. And I think they have other machinations about it. They look up at the stars and they say, oh, the stars, the stars are, they're, they're millions of light years away. And uh, you know what? When God created the earth, he created it with the appearance of age. He made a tree that was able to produce fruit. You look at that tree now and you'd say, well, that's producing fruit that has to be at least 10 years old. Or you see that tree, it's it's uh, three feet thick. It, it must be 125 years old. Uh, you see that man there? Uh, he's an adult and uh, he's got a beard and uh, he must be at least uh, 20, 25 years old. But you look at that man, you think he's 25 and he's only a day old. You look at that tree and you think it's 125 years old, but no, it's just it's just a couple days old. Uh, and the same with the stars. You look up at the stars and you see the light from the stars to the earth. Well, that took millions of years. Well, God created the stars, but he also created the light from the star to the earth, or otherwise that star wouldn't give any light at all, still be traveling here. So he created it with the appearance of age, and we fool ourselves into thinking how old the world is. Of course, somebody will say, oh, you're just fooling yourself. Well, hey, the heavens declare the glory of God, and they shout at nighttime about the greatness of God and uh, the world is filled with his glory I mean you see a little child and they walk through a field and oh they're stopping to see this bug and oh isn't that marvelous and look at the Sun and all these other things but we have lost the wonder of looking at God's creation and his stu stupendousness and we become ho-hum and we've lost the excitement of seeing the glory and power of God. I used to teach biology in high school. And for me, when I would study about the bugs and the butterflies, and when I'd study about the frogs and the fish and all, I would see the glory of God. And it was just a wonder to me and all the variety of things. And uh, people just need to get a bigger God. They need to allow God to be so great. I mean, this idea that everything is by time and chance, and uh, you just need enough time for things to happen. Well, if a tornado goes through a junkyard and can make a perfectly running car, then you can believe anything. And so I'm here to tell you, just because you add a couple more million or billion years of age, on to how old the universe is and therefore it can happen statistically that's not true it just can't happen uh, absolutes absolutes they people don't like absolutes oh there are no absolutes oh that's what you say oh that that's not true uh, that's adultery. Oh, who says it's adultery? It might be wrong for you because of your system, but it's not wrong over here. Thou shalt not lie. Boy, I hope, I wish people would get a hold of that. There's so much lying going on during political season. I get so fed up with some of the things I hear. It just about makes my mind explode. Thou shalt not kill. 
and all the things that are going on, uh, yeah. oh, we wouldn't want our teenagers to learn, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. Oh, those are dangerous concepts. Oh, bad, bad, bad. I'll tell you, we need absolutes. And you know why men don't want absolutes? They don't want absolutes because to have absolutes means that there's a supreme God who says this is right and this is wrong, and it makes them sinners. And they don't want that. They want to be allowed to do whatever they want, guilt-free, uh, without accountability. And the they, uh, oh, God that we have is holy. And we don't measure up. Isaiah chapter 6, the vision of the call of Isaiah into the ministry and the cherubim and seraphim. And they were saying, holy, holy, holy. That means that God is so transcendent and so far above anything that we can ask or think. And anything that has to do with uh, righteousness, he is so far so far righteous, and we cannot measure up to that. And he cannot permit holiness to come into his presence, unholiness to come into his presence. And so we, we can't get that holiness, no matter how hard we try. But we can have it imputed to us if somebody else pays our penalty uh, uh, on our offense to a righteous God. And he provides it himself. All we have to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and acknowledge who he is. You know, in the Garden of Eden, man and woman walked away from God. They decided that they would leave some lion skunk of a snake and that they would give credence to his words and believe him over what God already had done and shown. And uh, so they fell and they walked away from God. And they've been trying to get back to God ever since. And God says, okay, you believe the snake. Now you have to believe my words. And you have to choose to believe and by faith. And so one by one, man chooses to believe in God and have faith in him. And God won't accept you any other way. You've got to reverse the mistake that was made in the Garden of Eden by the choice to believe the lies, and you have to believe the truth. And so he is waiting for us to believe the truth that's in the Bible. And he starts out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you know what? The devil's got an argument, even with the first couple words. And you have to choose in your mind that you believe in creation and the absolutes in the Savior that he provided, and you make your way back to him. Oh, another thing that they mock is not only the absolutes, but uh, they mock the worldwide flood. It says that in Peter. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since creation, there's not been any change. Everything continues as it has been from the beginning. And Peter says when they say this, they forget that the world was destroyed by water. It wasn't there something called a worldwide flood? And, uh, you know, somebody says, well, there can't be that much water. That's just a children's story. How could that possibly be? And But the fact of the matter is, there is that much water on the earth. 70% of the surface of the earth is covered by water. And uh, it might be in uh, ice form in some places, but it's covered by water. Uh, there are places in the earth that have water 35,000 feet deep out in the Pacific. And that's higher than the highest mountain is right now. But, uh, you know, the earth at one time didn't have that high of mountains. But if you take the earth and make it smooth like a marble, and you take all the water and put it on top, it's uh, 12,000 feet high. Now, we don't know how high the mountains were at the time of the flood, but we know that the water worldwide was high enough 
to be at least 22 feet above the highest mountain. In this book, The World That Perished, by John Whitcomb Jr., I knew him. He passed away just this past year. And uh, in it, he talks about 70% uh, of the water, 35,000 feet in parts of the Western Pacific, and it says, if the Earth's surface were made completely even, it would everywhere be covered by approximately 12,000 feet of water. I don't know how these people figure all of this out, but uh, the man that he wrote the Genesis flood with was a hydrologist, uh, engineer, uh, expert in hydrology, and he knew how much water there was on the Earth. And, uh, you know, that ark... They have built a replica of the Ark there in Kentucky, near Cincinnati. And uh, that Ark, it says right here, assuming the minimum length of the cubit, 18 inches, <clears throat> the Ark had a capacity of nearly 1,400,000 cubic feet and was therefore so huge that 522 modern railroad boxcars could be fitted inside. That's how big that ark was. And uh, so, you know, it, it's amazing. You have these things happening and told about in the Bible. And people say, oh, there couldn't have been a worldwide flood. Well, there's fossils all over the world buried. And you don't get fossils except if the animals that have been, have died, have been completely covered over immediately we have millions and millions of carcasses of bison that were shot on purpose out there in the west in the 17 and 1800s <coughs> but you don't find them fossilized i lay it on top their carcasses rotted away their bones decomposed animals chewed them up you don't find bison fossils all over the earth no you don't uh, the only way is if they were to be covered immediately. And if you go, you'll find fossils all over the earth uh, because of this worldwide flood and these massive tsunamis of sand and mud and various such things like that. So, worldwide flood all over the earth. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until the 1900s when they started making steel ships that they were able to make ships as big as the Ark, and they found out that that was the most stable, barge-like uh, ship. And uh, so it was far, far in advance of uh, modern uh, technology and shipbuilding, even back at that time, and was told about in the Bible. So the worldwide flood, Noah's Ark, oh, all those animals, how could they get every animal on there? Didn't need to get every single animal on there. Uh, you know, you could have two dogs. And from those two dogs could be developed all the breeds we have today. All the way from a Chihuahua all the way up to a Great Dane and wolves and coyotes and foxes too. And the fish, of course, didn't have to get on there. They could survive. And some of the biggest animals like the whales... Uh, could manage, uh, but uh, they, these animals came two by two, and uh, the kinds, and they got on that ship. So it's very, very remarkable, and there's 120 years that Noah built that ark and preached to the people, and the earth was so far gone that he, his wife, his three sons and their wives are the only ones that got on that ship. And the animals were closed in. God closed the door. And for a week they sat there and not one drop of rain fell. I imagine the people were just laughing their heads off. But then the rain started to fall. Then the earth started to spew out from the deep springs, the water. And the beds perhaps began to rise up. And it covered those relatively low mountains. And all people on the earth were judged. 
Then they got off the ark some year later, and they were able to uh, uh, start the human race again. And you know, the creation story and the ark story are in various forms all over the world. And some of them got changed quite a bit, but some of them stay very, very close to what the Bible story was. I have uh, an account of the Miatsu people, or the Miao people, and uh, the flood. This They kept it straight. They were kind of a Chinese-based people. And uh, they wrote down in poetic couplet form, and this is what they said. And this was written 4,500 years ago. Uh, it says, So it poured 40 days in sheets and in torrents, then 55 days of misting and drizzle. The waters surmounted the mountains and ranges. The deluge ascended, leaped valley and hollow, and earth with no earth upon which to take refuge, a world with no foothold where one might subsist. The people were baffled, impotent, and ruined, despairing, horror-stricken, diminished, and finished. But the patriarch, Nua, was righteous. How about that? They even got the name very close. The matriarch, Gaboluen, upright, built a boat very wide, made a ship very vast. Their household entire got aboard and were floated. The family complete rode the deluge in safety, the animals with him were female and male. The birds went along and were mated in pairs. When the time was fulfilled, God commanded the waters. The day had arrived, the flood waters receded. Then Nua liberated a dove from their refuge, sent a bird to go forth and bring again tidings. The flood had gone down into the lake and to ocean. The mud was confined to the pools and the hollows. There was land once again where a man might reside. There was a place in the earth now to rear habitation. Buffalo then were brought an oblation to God. Fatter cattle became sacrificed to the mighty. The divine one then gave them his blessing. Now, isn't that interesting? This was written even before the Bible was written down. And that account is very similar to what the Bible has to say. Now, there are other accounts that are very, very far, far afield. They have some type of worldwide flood, but uh, they, you know, they get things wrong. It's quite a bit different, but this is very, very close. So it's interesting. Where did that come from? It came from some history orally passed on that was even older than what we find in the Bible. Now, the Bible was supernaturally preserved and inspired by the Spirit, and it is the account that we know is 100% accurate, but this isn't too bad. And uh, so uh, we have the worldwide flood, and stories about the worldwide flood from all over the world. The existence of hell, they mock that. Oh, there is no hell. Oh, that's just a made-up thing. That's made up by God to scare people so that uh, people will be encapsulated by religion. And, uh, you know, God isn't fooling around. And there is a place of paradise and blessing. And then there's a place, it says in the Bible in Matthew 25, created for the devil and his angels. And if you want to believe and go with that side, then you get to go there too. But God's intention is not for you to go there. He has provided a way of escape. And he has given to you a Savior who paid a terrible penalty that you might not go to that terrible place. And uh, don't think for some minute that that's an idle threat. That if you do not receive Christ as your Savior that you will uh, then get a second chance and end up not in hell. This is not the Catholic purgatory. That's a made-up thing. Um, purgatory, you can live your life terrible, and then they can pray a leg out and then a heart and an arm, and they can pay money and 
various such things to get you out of that by saying masses, well, that doesn't work. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ and accepting him as Lord and Savior. And then they, they will mock the exclusivity of Christ as the only way. And then Jesus Christ himself shot, a, shot across the bow when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the bother but by me. And um, Paul said something similar. He says, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There aren't many gods, many ways. There's only one way. And, of course, man mock that. And they say, who are you to say that your way is the best? Well, if it's the only way, it is the best way. And it has to be told. And, you know, there are people who are called missionaries will leave their family and their home and they'll go and learn a language and they'll learn to write the language down and translate the Bible in there and tell these people about Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we pay him good money and we help them go to do this because we believe this is true. There is a hell. And Jesus Christ is the only way. The goodness of God. How could God, a good God, allow somebody to go to hell? Well, it's a choice that man made. And and all these things, the tornadoes, and the floods, and diseases, and all these things that happen when man chose to sin and put himself under Satan, and the earth therefore changed and all these terrible things and wars and awful things that are happening. They're because of man's sin. And uh, God, in the midst of that, made a way for man to come back to him. And he's a good and gracious God and just. And he will judge evil as such. But he will provide a way through that evil with a righteous sacrifice that we might be saved. Now coming to Jude, I've looked at these things and just basically sur surveyed them. It also says here uh, in verse 18, in the last time there will be mockers, and we looked at things that they will mock, following after their own ungodly lusts, and then verse 19, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. Now, next week, I'm going to pick up there and I'm going to tell you about how we cannot be one with these people and how that is a mistake that uh, many people are sucked into because they think that... Uh, we, we are, as Christians, supposed to be one with one another when some Christians make such terrible error that you can't reconcile with them. 